Hey, y'all. Okay, so listen, you are ready to move to Houston, but you have questions about the loan process. Well, this is what we're doing today. I brought one of my favorite lenders out in Houston, and he's going to tell you guys some of his tips and tricks and just some of the things that he's seen to help you move on and move forward through your home ownership. So today I have with me Duke LeBlanc. Duke, tell him about yourself. Hey, good morning. Uh, yes, I am Duke LeBlanc. I am here in Houston as well. Um, excited for this new market we have in 2024. All kind of changes that are coming to our industry, and um, I look forward to seeing the, the different ways we approach those. So, um, yes, yeah, I'm excited, ready to go. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, so Duke, like, so what are some of like the major things that you are seeing happening today in the mortgage industry? What are buyers feeling? Um, I know you work with help, helping people. Like, if you're a homeowner, you help them with a uh, refinancing or. Um, equity loans, things like that. Just what are some of the major things you're seeing right now? Uh, so the major thing I'm seeing now is uh, the attention on interest rates. Everyone is just basically focused on that one word, interest rate, interest rate. And while it is extremely important to you know understand your interest rate, um, that's not the, the lead reason of why you should or shouldn't buy a house right now. Mm -hmm. And once we have, you know, those people are slowly coming around to understanding, okay, so the interest rates are, are what they are. What are my options? Your options are, well, let's go look at a house. Yeah, no, that's good. No, that's good. Yeah. So, yeah, so just going and, you know, looking at the house, look at the house and then figure out the rest of it kind of afterwards, but really, you know, probably still recommending that they get pre-approved first before they start looking. Absolutely. Um, so by us, like, for example, waiting on the interest rates, I heard a story the other day that the last time interest rates were at this number was 1971 mm. and it took until maybe 22 years later for you to see the dramatic change that everyone was expecting so yes we can all agree that this is a different time and it shouldn't take 22 years to see the interest rates drop it's just more the reason of another example of why we should not wait and expect that to happen it will come it may be 12 months it may be 36 months what interest rates you need to change your situation. We don't necessarily know that. So the interest rate is something that you can change several times along amongst the, the, the journey of your, your home ownership. Okay. You can buy the house today. You can refinance it next year. Um, you can refinance it a year after that. Okay. So the interest rate is something that we only should be looking at as a temporary placeholder for the long-term relationship you'll have with your property. Right. So basically, you know, don't worry about the interest rate because you'll probably be able to refinance in about two, three years to something more comfortable for you. And then this is no longer an issue for you. Absolutely. So. You definitely be refinancing. Um, again, we don't know the exact time frame. A lot of the people, you know, for the last few years have started at five and a half percent. Now mm -hmm. we're at, you know, seven, some seven and a half percent are going out. So depending on what year you bought, um, just depends on when it'll be the ideal time for you to worry about refinancing. Um, Got it. At the moment, we know, like, for example, last year was one of the highest um, increase in property value. And that's a major concern that we should be looking at as well. Um, the reality is if the interest rates so happen to just fall down 2% tomorrow, the increase and the amount of uh, people that are looking for homes will also go up. Yep. Which will in turn, you know, increase the property value because now there's five people looking at that same property that you was. And when initially, when the interest rates were high, you were the only one looking at that property. So it just turns into a, well, who wants to spend the most money on my property? I'm selling it to you and all five of you want it. Well, we're going to raise the price up. So that same money that you may have spent in interest or that same concern is now saying, well, your principal amount is now going to go up because this property is not worth the same it was yesterday. Exactly. And everybody saw that during COVID because, of course, interest rates going down two, three percent or whatever. And everybody all of a sudden started trying to buy. Yeah, and that's market. what increases supply and demand, y'all. So anyway, so I think that's good. That's very good for people to know the fact that these interest rates are a little bit higher. This is not the end of the world. You will have the opportunity to refinance someday. Um, so just keep trucking. If you have home ownership goals, Regardless, it's still better for you to go ahead and purchase. Well, financially, it is better yes. for you to go ahead and purchase a home now than for you to wait two, three years. And now you're, you're behind, you know, the mark. So 
anyway, so, okay. So one of the things that I know for sure that people are probably going to want to know is let's say that you, let's say you're, let's say you're a first time home buyer. Okay. What is the process? Like if, you, if you've never done this, break this down. Like you're talking to a fifth grader. What's the process that people should know as far as like <laughs> applying for the loan? Um, what, what frustrates people about applying for a loan? And then, you know, maybe we'll move on further. Um, okay. So the, the beginning is very simple. The few documents that you need are just pay stubs, W-2s, a driver's license, and the proof of your funds. So let's say, you know, three things that are important because clearly you can get your driver's license rather quickly. Mm -hmm. But your pay stub, your most recent pay stub, submit that. Last two years, W-2. So right now, it'd be 2022 and 2023. You submit those and also with your bank statement. You have to verify the funds that you will be using um, for your down payment. That has to be sourced through underwriting. But those things are very simple to get. You go download, you'll go to Chase, download the last month's bank statement. Go to your website, ADP or whoever you use, get your pay stub and your W-2 should be there as well. Submit those and you can get a review from an underwriter. So from there, um, the underwriters have their way of frustrating clients. And when you ask that question, it's normally be going through underwriting. Underwriting says, well, we don't like this bank statement. You took a screenshot of it. Or look at this large transaction. It is $7,000 in cash. Where did you get that from? You have to write a letter of explanation. But for the people that are just living, it's, you know, simple, that have their money in their savings account, their pay stub is 40 hours a week for the last couple of years, you would go through underwriting extremely smoothly and most of the time with, with you know, not many hurdles to grow. Okay. So this letter of explanation, sometimes that's just a way to kind of, uh, they just need th that documentation to kind of show that, okay, this is because of this reason. Um, and th that's a normal thing that people should expect, right? If, yes. If yes. If anytime in the process, um, there's something that's out of the ordinary, there's a letter of explanation that can go with it. And it's like you talking and communicating directly with the underwriter. So let's go back to the example. If you do have a $7,000 cash deposit, you can say, Hey, on your letter of explanation to whom this may concern, um, my dad gave me a $7,000 check and I cash it at the bank. Here's the check receipt. Here's the check. Okay. And yeah. then that would, be, that would, you know, allow the underwriter to say, Oh, okay. This is why that's there. That explains that no problem. And they'll move to the next one. Okay. Got it. So they apply with you online and then you're automatically pushing that to the underwriters immediately, or are you waiting until they find the house first? No, absolutely. We're going to put you through underwriting. We need those documents to get through underwriting. You will be reviewed and get a conditional approval. Okay. Um, once you have the conditional approval, then you guys are in a much stronger situation and place where you know when you go to put your offer in, um, this will be um, a, stronger, a stronger offer. Okay. Got it. Okay. So they did the application. They got the mm -hmm. conditional approval. Um, right. We found the house. And now, like, I tell you, hey, here's the contract. We, you know, they accepted my buyer's contract. What next? Uh, next, we get the contract and submit it to processing. Processing is going to do the, the first few steps. We're going to get the title work for that property. That will be the, the, the background, uh, you know, who had the house, the chain of command for the, that home. Um, any liens or anything that comes up that involved with that property, the prices, the, the, the previous purchase prices, the uh, tax amounts, the HOA, all the things that's associated with that property is going to be done with the title research. Um, and are you guys looking at that? Because I know the title company does that, but I guess I never realized that uh, lenders might be looking at that too. We definitely look at it. Um, what they say is golden. That's not our you know, role in, in the process. They okay. actually go and do that research. That's, you know, that's their arena. And um, if they say the property taxes are such and such percent, then that's what we have to go by. Mm -hmm. From there, we um, the title work, we get the uh, the appraisal order. Every home, you know, for the most part, has to have, have an appraisal on that property. And uh, when you get the contract in, that'll be the first two things we order. And uh, from there, we're in underwriting. Awesome. So I got a question about that. So okay. um, one thing that I always tell my buyers mm -hmm. is 
nothing really happens until we get outside of option period. Once the option period is over, that's when the lender and the title really start working. Is that accurate or do, are you guys already working on some things before we get out of our option period and inspection period time? No, that actually has little to do with us. Okay. As soon as we get the contract, we're on the ball. Okay. Uh, getting the orders, you know, getting the orders going uh, for that for that property. And then as far as the um, the contingency period, that's just, you know, associated directly with the buyer and the seller on when they want to determine a refund or not. If you can get your earnest money back, if you're actually involved in this for the long haul and is your money still on jeopardy. But that, as far as a lender, uh, that doesn't have much on our assembly line. We're going to okay. keep moving forward until you tell us to stop. Okay. Well, no, that's good to know. So then my other question, you talked about how, you know, you guys will do the, um, the title search and the appraisal piece. One of the things buyers, the appraisal I, would be the, uh, would, would be the answer. Actually, it okay. wouldn't be that when the appraisal comes back, that's kind of what we're waiting on. Okay. Once the appraisal comes back and it says, Hey, this is the value of the home. Then we can start the, the next, you know, uh, part of the, the journey because now we actually have a true value um before that is speculation well we hope it's going to come in at this amount you know what if it doesn't appraise for the value then we have to adjust all all kind of things you and the client have to go back and negotiate with the buyer uh, the sellers so we're really if there is any wait it would be okay we got you guys underwritten we see where you are let's wait for the appraisal to come back once we get the value and it meets the value then we can proceed to closing okay okay good okay so then my other question like um buyers know that up front I, I always tell them this is what you're going to pay for your inspection i try to give them like an estimate earnest money option money this that and the other but right. the appraisal piece they sometimes get confused about the appraisal piece and so i always tell them well that's the lender the lender they will shop around for different appraisals and y'all are gonna you know how does that work are they paying you guys directly is that appraisal cost in the closing cost or how does that work um so it depends on what lender you use um Whichever lender you're using, ninety nine percent of the time. They're using you. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. So you you will pay for the appraisal one way or the other. Yeah. Um, it's going to come on your 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 closing disclosure. If you pay for it before the closing, you're, it's still going to be on your closing disclosure. Um, uh, people get in confusion between the inspection and the appraiser because okay. they're both inspecting. They're both inspectors. Yeah. Not realizing that when you say the word inspector a lot of times the buyers are associating that one name with two different professions okay so the inspector comes out and the buyers pay them for the property to make sure that they're not buying a property that has wall leaks from a few years ago that is not really seen by the you know the normal human eye that's the inspection that you pay for you know up front before you even get past the contingency period right got it and then appraisal inspection that's just based on the home value period you want to get your home appraisal because well you don't want to buy a house for five hundred thousand dollars that's only worth four yeah no that and makes sense lender definitely doesn't want to lend you a hundred thousand dollars over property value as well so right. you have to order the you have to purchase the appraisal and then if the appraisal does not come in at the value then you still have that option to walk away and typically what the sellers will do is, oh, since my house is not worth this much, let me go ahead and adjust that and see how you and I can still you know, work for it in our contract. Yes. OK, y'all, that literally just happened with a client that I'm under contract with right now. Um, the lender sent the appraiser out and the appraiser said, no, this house is not worth four fifty five. It's only worth four fifty one. Mm -hmm. And so the seller is not required to reduce the price but they did reduce the price because they wanted to get the house sold so that scenario happens quite frequently i have had or i have seen where some sellers are like oh we're just not going to reduce the price and instead they would rather wait on conventional because that only matters right if it's an fha loan that doesn't matter if it's conventional right correct it only matters um in fha loans and conventional okay. loans you can um it does not necessarily have to it doesn't necessarily have to meet the, the appraisal price Okay, got it. So during this time frame, you kind of mentioned um, mainly the things that the thing, the different steps would be the title portion. If something comes back with that, then that might be a reason why uh, extra steps have to be performed or that you might have is issues with 
giving them a loan. Same thing with the appraisal. You may not give, you know, the loan be, if it's over appraised. You won't approve that amount. Um, what other things during the process of, you know, contract closing that people might get some sort of red flags or see some issues with? Staying still. When you are in the process of buying a home, you just want to just keep your life the same way it was when you walked into the lender's door. Meaning if you have a Walmart card with a $500 balance, let's not go max that card out or any other card for that matter. And if you was driving the Honda Accord that costs 300 bucks a month, you need to keep your Honda Accord until we right. close. You can't go trade your Honda Accord in right after you sign the contract for this new expedition that I want. Please don't. You know, um, because that changes everything and the dynamics, the structure of your loan. Yeah. It can cost you interest. It can cost you the entire loan. It often mm -hmm. does cost the buyers to back out of the loan because they uh, made a drastic change to their 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 uh, their debt. Yeah. So stay still. Don't inquire too much new debt or any F at all. Don't make any drastic changes um, to anything in your life. If so, ask your lender first. Let us review it. You know, that's you tell me, I hey, that's just call I me do. back and say, man, listen, I want this expedition. It's going to cost me 1200 bucks. I'm going to say, hey, uh-oh. Nope, you can have that expedition, but your house going to have to go down by $40,000. Mm. Which one do you want? Do you want a $300,000 home now instead of a three forty, dollars Or do you want to add the, you know, keep the, the, the Toyota for a few more months because we're closing in April? Right. Um, and then you can literally walk that with your lender and know that in your transaction, you'll be safe as far as your purchase of your new vehicle and also in your, your safe in, in, in your purchase of your home. Okay, cool stuff, cool stuff. Yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. I know you were onto the appraisal phase. What happens after the appraisal phase? What are you guys doing? What are my clients doing? What's, what's happening? We looking for the underwriter. At this okay. point, we're on the underwriter's desk. She has the documents. <clears throat> Excuse me. What? She okay. has the documents uh, from the uh, from the clients that she's requested already. She has the, the information from the appraiser to make sure that he doesn't have any um, requirements. And oftentimes, the, the appraiser will say, "Hey, you know, this needs to be done, or this is a safety hazard." Um, but once these things are addressed, or if they need to be addressed, then at that point, that's where we are. Um, a lot oftentimes once the appraisal come in, we're going back to negotiations with the seller. Mm -hmm. So as a lender, we're like, okay, did you guys make any other changes? Are they giving you more seller contributions because they don't want to paint that bathroom from black to, you know, the green that you asked for? Mm -hmm. There's so many things that could happen once the appraisal comes in because now we know where we stand as far as the value on this transaction. Anything before that is just a yeah. Let's all assume it comes in at four hundred thousand. Right. You know. Right. Well, I mean, so I know you're saying underwriter, just for the people that aren't familiar with that term, who is like, what does she do or he do? He. Yeah. What does he do? So the underwriter is basically, um, how could I say it? Um, the spokesperson, not the, the person that represents the bank as far as the approval or not. Okay. Know, the bank cannot be one person and say to every person, you're approved, you're approved. However, they can hire um the the underwriter which would be the person that stands and say hey this is what the bank says they want this is the rules this is what fha it depends on what type of loan you have if you have a fha conventional va or etc the underwriter is the person that's going to distinguish what's the rules what's what rules are being followed what needs to be followed what circumstance can we give to this person because of their situation you know for example a pregnancy if you're pregnant and you wasn't working for the last however many months even though the rule says you have to have two years consistency, consistent consecutive work uh, history, that's fine if you're a pregnant lady. There's a, a, a way around that. And that's the underwriter's job to say, well, this stipulation fits this. Um, this person is following all rules within, you know, my power. And yes, you're approved. And okay. if you're not approved, then this is the reason why. Can you fix this? Can you adjust this? Can you prove this is not true? If so, then you keep going. Got it. Got it. Got it. The underwriter okay. is the principal in the, you know, of, of the school, basically, if for your loan. Got it. So you're not the principal. You're not the one stamping approved, this, that, and the other. The underwriter is the one that does that. And then they let you know. And then you talk to your clients. Correct. If anything, your loan officer is your friend. If you and I, you know, not necessarily as this is a war. The underwriter is our friend. Right. Um, but it's my job as your originator 
to present your file to the underwriter in a way that she should go ahead and approve it. Got it. You're their advocate. Yeah. You're the buyer's yeah, advocate. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Okay, good. Okay. So the underwriter, she stamped it approved. Now what we doing? Once she stamps it approved, uh, we're looking, she on to uh, clear to close. That's the magic words in our industry. Clear okay, to close. Clear to close. So Y'all like to hear close, that. Yes, that's, that means we're done. You are the, the scrutiny of your file or your life and everything else they're going to dig into. They're done with that. Um, at this point, you should be setting up a um, a closing date with the the title company. The title okay. company is the same, you know, the same people that did the the background research and kind of orchestrated the transaction for you. We actually closed at their office. Okay. So we call the 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 the, the title company and and basically uh, set a closing date. That day, we go and sign your your seventy two pages. Um, I should be there with you as well to explain everything you're signing. And wow. um, a few hours later, you should have a, uh, the, the, the loan should be funded and you should be receiving your keys. Okay, good. Okay, yeah. so, all right, so all of that, you pretty much gave us an entire scope of the uh, lending process, which is great. Yeah. Um, and so after all this, so one of the things that, one of the questions that I have, one of the main questions okay. that I have. So a lot of times people get, you give them, after you give them the clear to close, you give them, um, or maybe even before that, you'll give them that closing disclosure that will have all their, um, it'll have the loan estimate and just more details on their loan and the taxes and all of that other good stuff. Right. And so I tend to always send them the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. They have mm -hmm. what's called a loan estimate explainer on their website. So a lot of times I send that to my clients so that they can, um, kind of go through there, you know, step by step. But I also know that Duke is always willing to go through that with my clients as well. So one of the things that I have noticed, like this year alone, I've had, I've had three of my clients that bought from me last year, come back this year and say that when it was time for the taxes, and I'm probably asking you something that's totally off base and not even part of your thing, but they were like, okay. when it's time for the taxes, you know, because at the closing table, they are, you're paying for taxes at the closing table, but then as part of their mortgage, they're putting a piece for the taxes into escrow so that when the next tax bill comes due, they'll have that money. But a lot of them, I've had, well, those three people at least were saying that what they put in escrow did not cover their tax bill. And so I'm almost, I guess my question was why, but then I was having this conversation with someone recently and they were like, they were told that they needed to add an extra 200, 300 to their escrow. I didn't even know that you can do that. Just increase the amount that you're putting in escrow. So have you heard us? Is this something that people should be asking you when they're applying for a loan or is there somebody else? Or is that something I <laughs> as a realtor should have known because I learned something new being honest. <laughs> no, no. So <clears throat> here's the problem. There is no answer to that because what we're trying to do is, and it happened to me you know, recently as well, um if we close before the tax bill is due you know we closed in july and the tax bill doesn't come out until august then if you close in july that day it has to be estimated it's an estimate on what they're going to say in in august there's no way in the world that someone can estimate or you know be accurate that much yeah and what the appraisal district is going to do with taxes yeah. so the few times that that does happen it normally only happens in new construction that's what yeah that's exactly what i was thinking that's i was like what, he told me and i do a um, lot of new construction well in, in this scenario what happened in, in, in our new markets all our home values are going up so okay. you don't know the last time another house was sold appraised or the district adjusted those numbers i've seen homes that went up a thousand dollars you know, existing homes that went up a thousand dollars just because our our market is so much more valuable now. Uh, yes. So, in that scenario, and that's why I went. You know, we close in July. How in the world would you be able to predict what's going to happen in August? And this is a title company thing. This is not your lender or your agent. That's why I said, no, don't worry about it. It's not you or me. It's there is no there is no uh, there's no transparency. There's that, no the transparency. There's no possible way to predict that. Well, that's um, true. 
So what they do is they give an estimate. And this is this doesn't happen. Most of the time they shoot over. This case that we're talking about is very rare in between. It's not like this happens often. Um, and the two, the two that I'm thinking of right now for sure, they were um they were new construction. And yeah. so three actually. But and then yeah. we can talk about that. I can give you the, the, the reason. The reason why in new construction is because the house last year wasn't there. Yeah. It was just the land. Yeah. The land was appraised and valued. And since we don't know what that is going to be next year, think about it. Last year, this land was worth $40,000. You just put a $400,000 structure on it. It's not worth the same. Right. And there's no taxes that have ever been created for it for you to be able to close on. So a new construction, in short, that's the reason why that following year, poof, you owe for taxes. So at closing, if you use... If you if you were to work with me, I would tell you, hey, this is new construction. Maybe you should save a few extra hundred dollars because yeah. next year when this house is assessed, um, the bill will be adjusted as well, and it will it will have the home you just built on it included. So yeah. you want to make sure that when you start your mortgage off, that you won't be a few hundred dollars behind every month, and at the end of the year, owe oh, a couple thousand dollars. Exactly. Exactly. And I honestly like that for sure is going to be my advice to people. Go ahead and add an extra hundred to two hundred dollars in your escrow each month um, just in case things go crazy like that. And so. Um, so, yeah. Anyways, I think that's good to know. And I also do believe, honestly, there needs to be some trends. So I understand for like a resale, you don't know. Right. But for the for the new construction, that's going to happen almost. It's probably happened other times that people exactly. just have complained about it but I it just, just don't depends have on your have... lender yeah okay it just depends got on it. your lender got it got it got it like um, some lenders automatically include the um proposed taxes for that new property next year either okay. way and you can also request to close on unimproved land it's your it's your choice Say the, that clients again? Just, the clients don't normally know that you can choose to pay for your taxes on the improved land and value or the unimproved. That means literally that you could your taxes as closing can go from eighty five dollars up to six hundred dollars in Texas, right? Okay. You know, it just depends on quite a few things. But Got of it. course, someone who doesn't know any better is going to see the eighty five dollars and be like, "Oh, I'm closing with that number." Yeah, and most buyers are not <laughs> going to want that. You know, they're not going to want to pay that extra money, <laughs> but they still would like to know that hey, next year I better you have, have a four thousand dollar bill. Yes. If you don't pay this, you're going, you're going yes. to pay it one way or the other. Yes, so. yes, yes. And like one of my clients, she was able to go ahead and pay it, you know, out of their savings. The other guy was like, you know, I think they must have came up with like either a payment plan or they have like a deficit. There's a way that they handle it when people can't they pay. They kind of restructure your loan the next year. You won't be the okay. first and you won't be the last person that, you know, didn't right. close with the proper taxes. And they're not going to, you know, the goal is not to kick you out of the house. Um, not from you know our standpoint the investors right. whoever whoever uh truthfully on the property um there is a way if you ever get behind they give you a year sometimes they stretch out over two years and allow your escrow to build back up in a way that you can manage and afford okay got and you're talking about the taxes specifically yes okay got it. Well, yeah because that's when you know when you don't close properly when you don't close with the taxes you start off first year in the hole on the tax. The hole, yeah, 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 for sure. Like negative escrow. Okay, yep. so all right, y'all. So this is why also like every single year. So I mainly represent clients in Fort Bend County, but even for Harris County and I think Brazoria County. So like the deadline is May the fifteenth to protest your protest your taxes. I will tell everybody to protest their taxes. Like most people in the real estate industry are protesting their taxes every single year. Um, you can reach yeah. out and I can find out how I can help you. Um, as well as I can connect you with companies that actually do that for you. Um, and one of them, like for sure, doesn't even like if if they don't reduce your taxes, you don't pay at all. So mm. I've posted this on my social media a couple of times, but for sure, y'all reach out to me, 713-835-2928 if you have any questions about that. And I'll connect you with somebody. Um, OK, y'all. So look, so Damien. I just want to know I have taking a lot of your time, but I want to know, do you have any tips of the week for everybody that's trying to move to Houston or get a loan or anything like that? What's your tips? Um, Be aware, be aware of what you're getting into, you know, make sure that you, you're ready to commit to the loan. 
Um, it's not a big deal, but it is a, a, a big jump for, for, for most, um, regardless if it's your second or third property. You know, this still is one of the largest transactions you'll make in your life. Mm -hmm. So um, also, as far as coming to Houston, you know, we're one of the fastest growing cities in the nation. Um, so our inventory is low. Uh, you will be in competition. Um, and get pre-approved first. There's nothing better than preparing for the biggest financial transaction of your life than actually being prepared. You know, like come here early. If you're a year in head and say, hey, I'm moving in 2025. Yes. Great. Let's see what that looks like. How much do you want to spend? Oh, look at this credit card bill. Maybe over the next 12 months, we want to lower that. And this will get your debt to income ratio up. If you come in 2025 and say, hey, now I'm ready, you may be the person that says, okay, well, you won't get it until 2026. Mm -hmm. Not saying you won't qualify because you have an 800 credit score and a nice income, but you may not qualify for what you want. Right. We don't know what, you know, taste buds you have or what income you would like to spend, what part of portion of your income you would like to spend on your home. Yeah, because so, a lot of people got some high taste buds, but they don't want to spend yeah. a lot on their home. You know, I don't want everyone to think, hey, listen, if you make a million dollars a year, that's great. If 900,000 of it is missing, that person that makes 50 grand is going to qualify for a home, you know, just as big as you do. So it's not about how much you make. It's about how much you spend. That's true. That's really how much true, do we though. retain monthly. They don't care about how much debt you have. How much are you monthly? What are your monthly obligations? If you owe a million dollars in student loans and the contract says you owe twenty five dollars a month, that is the only thing we worried about. Awesome. Awesome. OK, yep. well, Duke, tell them how do you want them to reach out to you? Um, hey, listen, give me a call. Go apply to the website. Go to approveme.net. Um, we'll have your application that day or that next morning. You will have a full review. Give me a call. Uh, you can call me on my cell phone, 337-884-9366. Uh, call me anytime. I'm here. You know, it's the weekend. Give me a call so you can go shop and get pre-approved and uh, be successful. 337-884-9366. Awesome. All right, y'all. So, again, I am Shadria Patton. I'm with JPAR Real Estate. If you guys have any questions about the lending process, you can reach out to me or reach out to Duke, and one of us will be glad to help you walk through the process. And, again, it's always great to be pre-approved as early as possible, honestly. Yes. Um, but some people just want a buyer consultation. If you want to just talk about the process, talk about communities, all of that, I got resources I can send you, and I would just love to connect with you. All right, y'all. Bye. Bye.